Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. I, I um, want to let you know that um, our regular minister, Tom McDermott, is not here. His mother passed away on Friday. And so he asked me to talk with you guys today. I'm Sharm Robarts, for those of you who are visiting. We're always glad to have visitors. If this is your first time here, I hope you get a chance to meet somebody in a chair next to you because we want you to feel welcome here. Of course, Tom and his family are grieving because he lost his mother, and just a few days before that, uh, his mother-in-law passed away. So it's a hard time for them, but we're always aware when we come to church that there are many people here who are also struggling, grieving, dealing with loss, having uh, lots of issues that are difficult. And so we always hope that when you're here at church, somehow it will lighten the load for you just a little bit. And if we can help you in any way, I hope that you will let one of us know. We're going to begin with our uh, new ritual that we started last week, uh, the welcome candle. And Don, if you'll come on up. You'll find that right here. I'm going to say these words, and then I would like for you to repeat them also. And we're going to do that together week after week as a new ritual for 2017. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again. And now you. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again. Amen. And now, we'll have some music. Thank you, Don.
before we have our offering song that we will all sing together at which time you can bring your offering bring your registration up let's pray together holy one we acknowledge the presence of all that is good and holy in this space we give thanks for our time together we give thanks for the possibility that we might be able to help each other we give thanks for all the ways in which our lives can unfold in meaningful and purposeful ways Thank you again for this time together. Amen. I'd like to invite all you great people to stand and sing with us right now, would you please? We've got lyrics behind us, lyrics in the bulletin. Sing out nice and big. Verse one, here we go. There are no steps to this sacred dance. Just the feel of your feet on the floor. Yeah. Arms in the air, as free as your birth, and as simple as a wave on the shore. All right. Voices you heard have no power here. Find a rhythm that fits how you live. Silence the critical voices inside us. Let's strain our lives through a sin. Here we go. God of pleasure and wilderness, grant us the wisdom to dance with creation. God of wonder and bliss, give us life for the beauty of our revelations. As we stretch out our hands to the heavens so Dance be a friend. Verse 2, let's get it. We move in a mystery of all that we see. We dance for the wonder of being. We dance. 
gets through the struggles to remind us how the truth is finally free. Yeah. God of pleasure and wilderness, grant us the wisdom to dance with creation. God of wonder and bliss, give us love for the beauty of all our relations. Yeah. As we stretch out our so pray. let the states be our prayer. Everybody solo, let's go. Sing together, here we go. Come dance with your brothers and leave all your cares. Come, sisters and mothers, and let down your hair. Come, stars of the morning and darkest of night. For the joy of creation's God's greatest delight. God of pleasure and wilderness, grant us the wisdom to dance with creation. Wonder and bliss, give us love for the beauty of all our relations. As we stretch out our hands to the heavens so big. God of pleasure and wilderness, grant us the wisdom to dance with creation. God of wonder and bliss, give us love for the beauty of all our relations oh, yeah. as we stretch out our hands to the heavens so pray. let this dance be our prayer Would you people take a moment and offer one another a sign of peace for me, please? We're going to invite everybody to sing this song with us, if you would. It's oh, yeah. Brad Thompson wrote the first song that we played. Let's have a round of applause. I wanted everybody to know that. Very cool. Sorry, Brad. Everybody sing along. As the music at the pain quest.
our Kairos moment. This is a time when we stop together and just breathe. And so I invite you, if it's helpful to you, to close your eyes. Just be still. Just think about the fact that the chair is holding you up. You don't even have to work for that. Throughout this week, you're going to have plenty of times when it would be good to stop. Good to breathe. Important to give thanks. Let the quiet kind of soothe us. is a noisy, busy place and lots of times that's really good. But there's so much goodness and mystery in the quiet in this moment now. Let us become more and more aware of the sacredness of time between time between what was and what will be, time to know and to trust that all will be well. Amen. Today's scripture is from Job. I'm ridiculed by my friends. So that's the man who had conversations with God. Ridiculed without mercy. Look at the man who never did wrong. It's easy for the well-to-do to point their fingers and blame, for the well-fixed to pour scorn on the strugglers. Crooks reside safely in high-security houses. Insolent blasphemers live in luxury. They've bought and paid for a God who will protect them. But ask the animals what they think. Let them teach you. Let the birds tell you what's going on. Put your ear to the earth. Learn the basics. Listen. The fish in the ocean will tell you their stories. Isn't it clear that they all know and agree that God is the ground of being itself, that all things in God's embrace, every living soul, yes, every breathing creature,
I think I'm losing my ear here. <laughs> Can y'all see that I don't do this every time? But I, I think I've told you all a story about when I was uh, much younger. This was in the 90s. I, I actually have been a public speaker just about all my life. Um, but anyway, I was kind of new to all of this kind of thing. And I had one of these that was supposed to hook onto my shirt. And that proved to nearly be a wardrobe malfunction because it was heavy and it hung down. So I, I, I managed that for the first hour that I was speaking, and then I uh, switched it over to my skirt, which also became a, a burden. So anyway, all that to say, uh, thank you for letting me get myself back together. Um, I tell you what, I, I've got to tell you how this goes every week as we get ready for 11-11. And so even though I'm not always the speaker, I do meet with Tom and Brad, and we talk about you know, what message we're trying to convey, and then we start throwing out songs that might work. And of course, we look for songs, the, the lyrics of which have meaning uh, toward the message or just in general. And then Brad does his magic and figures out what music will actually work and what uh, musicians are available. And then like today, he invites a guest. I've, I've lost sight of our guest. There he is. And uh, it's just like magic and wonder. And it always is. You know that because you're here. But why I wanted to say that to you right now is I didn't pick out these songs today uh, because Tom was going to preach. But then, of course, his mother died. But as I was listening to that first song, which Brad Thompson wrote, about, you know, finding God, seeing God and the brother and the sister and in life and in love, and then uh, the beautiful So Are You to Me, again, trying to speak of, of who and what is God, you're not going to believe what I'm about to preach about. <laughs> Even though I did not, uh, I'm not preaching, I'm talking, even though I didn't get to pick the, pick the songs, they just fit together so well, and I just think that's, that's really cool. And Thank you, musicians, for such a good start today. Well, last week, Tom started this series called uh, Life is Like That. He started by asking all of us to finish this sentence, Life is... And we came up with a lot of ideas. Life is a box of chocolates. Life is a bowl of cherries. It's, life is long. Life is short. Life is hard. Life is what you make it. All of those options and many more showing, of course, that life is not just one thing. That's obvious, right? But since we have this gift of language, we're constantly looking for metaphors. We're looking for ways to talk about this wonderful and terrible and mysterious existence of life. And because we are meaning-making creatures, we, meaning the whole race, we're always speaking, looking for language and developing language about what we call faith. Across various religious understandings, there are these things in common. First, there is just this 
this consciousness, this awareness of life, this gift of life. I have it, you have it, we have it. Right beside that, there's usually some questioning and curiosity about where did it come from? What are we doing here? So that's the one thing, the awareness and the questioning. And then right beside it in religious thought, there's always some kind of sense that we should or we want to live a certain way in order to keep living, frankly. So religions put all of that in words, and they say things like, this is how you got here, this is what it means, and this is how you should live. And uh, that way of living is looked upon usually as a way to honor the gift of life and to honor the giver of life. We live this way because we live in gratitude for life and the life giver. And so um, it's easy to see then how, how word, the words about life and God and faith all get intermingled as we make our way through life. And the words we use, of course, to talk about faith and life and God are always evolving because we're always evolving. We're changing our minds. We're rethinking. We're getting some new information. And we're always then trying to interpret, trying to pull out meaning from this experience of life. And it's human nature to always include God somehow, some way, in that conversation. And then maybe when we start to press on the real difficult questions about all of this, we may think, man, I'm just talking in circles, I'm thinking in circles because I'm asking who is God, what is God, where is God, and then the big one, who, what, where is God in the face of so much suffering and violence. Now, I've asked these questions all my life, and I'm pretty sure I will keep on asking them, and it makes me glad to know that a lot of people do. I know a lot of you. We're always asking these questions, but you know, what's interesting to me is that even for lack of sufficient words to settle the whole matter on who, what, and where is God, even for lack of clarity of what I think or what we all think, and even for the fact that it seems like we can change our minds all the time about those big questions, it's interesting to me that it doesn't really keep us from trying to figure out how to live a good life. How to live in such a way as to contribute to our own well-being as well as to the well-being of others. So I'm going to continue with our theme, Life is Like That. And for my thoughts this morning, I'm just going to say that whenever we're talking about, or when I'm talking about how life is, on some level, I know that I'm talking about God. So I'm going to start with Shakespeare. The play is Julius Caesar. The speaker is Brutus. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which, taken at the flood, leads on toward fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of life is stranded on shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea we now float, and we must take the current as it serves, or lose our fortunes. Now, setting aside the historical thing there with Brutus and Octavius in battle for uh, the city of Rome, Rome, what Brutus is saying is that life is like a vast ocean, a full sea. It has opportunities. It has threats. Brutus is saying, however, we do have this chance, this chance to go with the flow of the tide and to find success. To miss out on it or to pass it up, well, we're going to find ourselves, as he says, in the shallows and in the miseries. Jesus told this story. He said there was a man who went out into a field one day. He was wandering around and he found a treasure. And he realized how valuable it was. So you know what he did? He went down to Frost Bank, took all of his money out and went back and bought the whole field. Because he knew how valuable that field was. That treasure hunter in Jesus' story rode the opportunity, uh, the tide of opportunity, and he gave it everything he had in order to purchase that field because he knew it was valuable. Now, these two stories, one from Shakespeare, one from, from Jesus, opened the door for us to talk about how that in life there are some things that are so important that we must pursue them. We must catch the wave. We must go with the flow of the tide that leads to them. Because if we don't, 
we lose out on something really important. So for Brutus, it was the victory over the city of Rome. And for Jesus, it was the kingdom of God. And for both, the goal was worth every effort. So what in the world would make somebody spend all effort to get it? Well, it's not going to be any great revelation to you that the thing that is worth most, it's worth everything to us, is our relationships. The thing that matters the most, our relationships. And given that the stories of Jesus and other statements he made seem to lean in that direction, I think it's um, not out of place for me to say that when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, we can say the kingdom of God because Jesus was always talking about relationships, always talking about our life together, our life together caught up in the life of God. As we all well know, though, relationships are difficult. So we can say all day how important they are. But man, they're tough, aren't they? And some of them are sort of front-loaded with difficulty. Think, for instance, of uh, uh, like, um, okay, let's go ahead and say it, in-laws. That's supposed to be a really, really tough relationship. There's a young man who got engaged, and so he calls his mom up, and he says, Mom, I'm going to bring three girls over. And I want you to guess which one is going to be my fiance. <laughs> so off he goes with this ill-planned plot. And he, he walks in the front door with these three girls. And he goes, okay, mom, guess which one is your new, going to be your new daughter-in-law? She goes, that one in the striped shirt. Mom, how on earth did you know? I just don't like her. <laughs> So on the front end, some of our relationships are supposed to be hard. Nothing like getting what you expect, right? So none of us, none of us are flawless at our relationships. So it's a pretty good idea, I think, to come to church and to encourage each other about the hard work that's involved in relationships and to encourage each other about things that, of course, we already know, but that are pretty easy to forget from time to time, and I find out in my own life there's plenty of obvious things that just need to be restated, and I need to hear them again. So, interestingly, as I was thinking about how that the relationships in our, uh, our lives are like this great treasure and that was worth every effort, I realized that some of the things we constantly emphasize right here in 1111 are very useful for good relationships. For instance, our Kairos time each week. That's, of course, when we pause, we pay attention to where we are right now. We talk about being in the moment, about not being somewhere stuck in the past, about not leaning too far into the future because we're right here and we're just trying to be here. Now, that practice is really, really useful in relationships, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Being present is the stuff of really good listening. It's the stuff of kind and close attentiveness. And maybe it's the playing ground for just looking at someone and appreciating them. I know this sounds like Hallmark card stuff, but I'm telling you what, when we treat people that way, they feel loved, they feel cared for, they feel secure in the relationship. So this good practice we have of being uh, present in the moment, recognizing the sacredness, and we mustn't be afraid of that word, the sacredness of life and breath and of those around us. That little thing that we practice each week can overflow into our relationships and our daily lives. Excuse me, just a minute. Another benefit of our Kairos time which we might also call, call the practice of mindfulness, is that slowing down and you know, checking our breath is actually resetting our brains. You can read all about this. This is how it works. When we take deep breaths, we reset our brains, and this is really useful in those difficult conversations and relationships that we have. When things get tense with people, it's useful 
to be able to slow down and reset our brains. I'm not saying it's wrong to get angry and to have an outburst, but I am saying that if we don't have the capacity for resetting, for slowing down the anger, then we are very likely to say and to do things that are pretty hard to get over. And so when we practice Kairos each week, maybe we can just think of it as a short exercise of something we're pretty much going to need later. That will really help us self-regulate. It will help and it will make a difference in our relationships. Well, another thing that you hear a lot about in 1111, of course, uh, and this is a very common theme with Tom, and I appreciate it so much. We talk a lot about connectivity and our common humanity. Pretty often our messages and our songs are built somewhere around that theme or they point us to thinking about all the many things that we have in common. And it, it's one of those obvious things, but our relationships are so enhanced by that realization. Think about it. Serious conflicts are because of the loss of the idea of our common humanity and, and the loss of respect that is unfolded in that. We share the same life force with people around us. We share life. We share a need for food and for love and for dignity. We have so much in common, this common humanity. And we also have a lot in common when it comes to inadequacies. We're in common like that. Nobody can do everything. Nobody knows everything. But we're so powerful all together. And so this intentional focus that we have at 1111 on connectivity is something that can really help us make and keep good relationships especially when things are starting to unglue a little bit, a little bit. We, we also focus on diversity, which is not in conflict with our common humanity. In our families and in our friendships, one of the healthiest and happiest things we can do is to accept and embrace difference. These differences actually can serve to enlarge us, enlarge our vision of, of, of our own life, of humanity in general, and I think to enlarge our vision of God. That's the power of understanding and, and embracing difference. I think um, sometimes we pretty well often, we have to remind ourselves that just because someone thinks differently or does some things differently, I, I really don't have to be threatened by that. I really don't have to be afraid that my own sense of how to do things is being threatened simply because someone else thinks differently. But, oh, that fear is always right under the surface, isn't it? That's the problem. We, 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 we sometimes keep ourselves from having great relationships because we fear the difference that we see in others. Who knows what treasures we might find if we could stop being so afraid of people being a little different from us. Well, the last thing I'll mention here uh, that we do in 1111 that's pertinent to our relationships is that we celebrate. Now, we celebrate in all kinds of ways, but I'm just going to focus on the music. Music is this huge vehicle for, uh, for shared emotion. It's a huge vehicle for shared celebration. Music has this power to reach down deep into our psyches and, and, and touch us in ways that we might not have been before. And it also sort of transports us to bounds uh, outside of our consciousness. And as we experience this music together week after week after week, and as we sing together, of course, we're creating bonds here for ourselves. But we're reminded again, if we think about it, of our common humanity because here we all are being moved by the same music, being moved by the same ideas. Music is the stuff of renewal. It's the stuff of celebration. And, of course, those things are agents for our healing. If we could just carry that with us, that feeling that we get when we hear the music and we're all here together, that renewal and celebration, if we could carry that into our week and let it characterize our relationships... Maybe, just maybe, we could deal a little more easily with conflicts that come up. Maybe we could find ways to change ourselves a little bit to make the relationships work better. You know, life is just not all about tasks and responsibilities and duties and expectations. It's also about fun and celebration and that feeling 
that, that we get from music. And although, you know, we like the big celebrations and these big moments here when we're all together, how would it be if we just carried that feeling out of here with us and, and pulled it out and, and poured it at times when it could be a balm for our relationships? Now, obviously, we all have these relationships that are really close. We have people that are in our inner circle, and those relationships, I'm going to preach just a little, they have to have attention. They won't survive if we ignore them. They, they won't survive if we impose our will all the time. They won't survive if we fail at empathy. These relationships are great treasures, and they, observe, they, they deserve our sacred attention. But even our casual acquaintances... Let's don't forget about those. Those people that we just bump into at the grocery store, everywhere in our daily path, they also deserve our honor and respect because all of our lives are caught up in the life of God. That's true for every one of us. And so to end, life is like this. Healthy, good relationships are treasures in the fields of our lives we can do a lot of things to hold on to them. We can do a lot of things to make them better. We can cherish them and nurture them. And when we do, we are part of healing the world. And that might just be what our purpose is. Amen. Got a 10 year tan and his own little junk store. Some people got a lot to prove, but that's the way I used to be. Now, now I'm just an old hippie with a half a dozen PhDs. Some choices hold you back, some chances set you free. Right out of
Hey everybody, take a look at the back of your bulletins. There's lots of news in there of things that are going on in our church. If you have any questions, please let somebody know. Call our church, uh, email, do whatever you want to find out the answers to your questions. We're really glad you came today. And so let's stand up together and we'll say a prayer before we go. And if you want to take somebody's hand, that's wonderful. I don't, know, I don't know whose hand to hold here. Okay. So I don't know why that's hard. Um, this is Martin Luther King uh, weekend, as you know. And so one thing I want to say is to remind us of his wonderful statement that we often sing about in here. Um, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can. And so, Holy One, we pray that we might be light, that we will light the dark places of people's souls that we will show the way to goodness and joy. We will look for ways to solve problems, and we will look for ways to change ourselves. All these things we pray in the, one, in the name of the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. Amen. Be the rise with you. Short sure.